Hi everybody, it's Adam with HeartValveSurgery.com and today we have a very exciting surgeon question and answer session all about robotic mitral valve replacement surgery. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Robert Smith, who's a leading cardiac surgeon at Baylor Scott & White, the Heart Hospital in Plano, Texas. During his extraordinary career, Dr. Smith has performed over 3,000 cardiac procedures with more than 1,500 involving some form of heart valve repair or replacement therapy. Dr. Smith, you and I have known each other for a long time, and I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. Adam, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be with you and your patients. Yeah, so we're going to get all into robotic mitral valve replacement surgery. But first, Dr. Smith, for patients who may have recently been diagnosed, can you help them understand what is mitral valve disease? It comes in basically two flavors, mitral valve regurgitation or mitral valve stenosis. Now, there's a variety of severity within that. But that's the two basic issues that we're dealing with. And regurgitation means a leaky valve and stenosis means a tight valve. Dr. Smith, can you talk about some of the symptoms that a patient with mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis might have? For both mitral valve stenosis and mitral regurgitation, probably one of the earliest symptoms that patients will experience is fatigue. It can be really insidious, creeping up on them. And oftentimes I'll have to ask their partner or spouse, is it really affecting them? Probably the second biggest thing after we get from that is shortness of breath. Now, shortness of breath is oftentimes one of the things patients experience when they're exercising or doing something. It may be getting to the top of the stairs and having to take a real big, deep breath, like a sigh, or it could be going out for a walk and not being able to get quite as far as you used to get. Unfortunately, as these disease processes continue to get worse, patients will feel worse sometimes with swelling in their legs and a real inability to get through their day. Dr. Smith, these are no doubt debilitating symptoms. And I'm curious to know, are there any serious health risks for patients who have mitral valve disease? That's a great point to this. As the disease severity worsens, patients can not only develop these symptoms, but real medical issues associated. Number one would be atrial fibrillation. This is a particularly bad one where patients' heart rates can race really fast. They can almost feel like they're racing, but sitting in a chair. Uh, in addition, the heart muscle can weaken over time, causing heart failure. And ultimately, patients can succumb to this and it can lead to death. So Dr. Smith, given the seriousness of the symptoms and the potential health risks, I gotta ask you, how do you go about treating mitral valve disease? So in trying to determine what's the right treatment, I really have to know what is the problem? Is it regurgitation or stenosis? And so that helps me decide, is this gonna be a repair of the valve where we really leave all the native structure of the valve and just support it and put it in the right place? Or is this valve kind of so broken that I need to replace it? And in that case, and in both cases really, we have another decision to make, which is what's the right approach to get to the valve. For patients who only have a mitral valve problem or have a mitral valve problem and another valve problem like a tricuspid valve problem, which can oftentimes be associated with mitral valve disease, we, we usually can use minimally invasive techniques to get there. And minimally invasive techniques can sometimes mean a small incision in the side of the chest or and more commonly what I do is robotic surgery where we make little small port incisions in the chest and a small incision down in the groin for the heart lung machine. And through that, we can do the entire procedure, either a repair or a replacement. I'm really curious to know when it comes to the robot, what is it from your perspective, the surgeon's perspective, that's advantageous for you? Adam, when I use the robot, the real big piece for the patient is the fact that while we put little small incisions on the chest, the ports that go through the rib spaces don't really widen the rib spaces. And so that really limits the trauma that the chest experiences. And what does that really mean for the patient who's undergoing surgery? It means getting over surgery faster. So the idea here is I'm doing the same thing that I would either otherwise do through a sternotomy or through a port access, which is the small incision uh, approach. And I'm doing it with less chest wall trauma, which means faster recovery. And the reason we can do this is these ports through them, those arms come in where the instruments are attached 
and there's first off amazing visualization it's it's high def 3d uh and the instruments come with little wrists on them so i'm basically performing the same kind of wrist maneuvers that my hands would make on the end of an instrument deep inside of the chest Dr. Smith, it's great to hear about the advantages, not just for the patient, but also for you as you perform robotic mitral valve therapies. And I want to backtrack. You mentioned earlier that you perform not only mitral valve repair procedures using a robot, but robotic mitral valve replacement. And this is really new news to me. I had heard for many years about the FDA approval for repair, but can you talk about the evolution of the utility of the robot? for replacing mitral valves? The issue is sometimes a mitral valve repair, despite all of your best intentions, is not going as well as it should for the patient to provide a durable relief of their regurgitation. And so then you need to think about, hey, I need to put in a replacement here. Well, if that's the case, I don't wanna stop a procedure, take the robot out and change to a port access approach or a sternotomy approach. Well, really the valves are, pretty small. I can put it in through a little side port between the ribs and not really have to convert anything, maintain the same approach and the same limited chest wall trauma, and the patient can get over it just as well. Dr. Smith, this is fascinating. Let's, let's talk a little more about that. How have the next generation valve replacement devices enabled you to perform these mitral valve replacements robotically? As we've really advanced the way that we get to the heart, now we're in the robotic stage of things. The valves themselves had to improve over time in order to allow us to get them through the small rib space that's there uh, to minimize chest wall trauma. And so some of the things that have occurred is number one, they're very low profile. So instead of these really long arms, they've been really shortened. And the next thing is the material that they're made of, the framework itself, it's become more flexible. So we can fold these guys flat, slip them in through that small rib space and secure them back into the mitral valve area, just as if we had done a regular procedure. And then once we allow them to open, they spring open just like we would have it if we had done an old, old time open replacement. Dr. Smith, one of the big considerations that patients have is durability of valve replacements. And I'm just curious to know, is there any trade-off here when you go minimally invasive using a robot and some of these newer heart valve replacement devices? Adam, as far as the way we approach the heart, that part doesn't make a difference as far as how the valve's gonna last. Valves generally come in two basic flavors. The mechanical valve, which is a, a really well-tested valve for durability, is one we oftentimes use in younger patients. Now those valves, the downside about them is you gotta use a fair amount of blood thinner. Uh, tissue valves, when we look at the long-term, they don't really require the blood thinner specifically for the valve, except for the first three months. They've also had considerable improvements in the way that they designed those valves, including anti-calcifying agents uh, to try to make the tissue themselves last longer. When we take, for instance, the Epic valve, which is a, a pig valve, those valves, when we look at over about a 10 year period of time, 96% of patients would expect to have freedom from structural valve deterioration. And what that means is, hey, I don't really need to go in there and replace that valve because it looks almost like it did when I put it in. Dr. Smith, that's amazing to hear about the low incidence of reoperation for the Epic Plus valve. I understand that there is also some other new innovations for that specific valve, if by chance a patient needs some kind of reintervention down the road. Can you talk a little bit about that? Adam, one of the really great things about the population at large is we're living longer. Even those patients who have had previous valve replacement surgery are living longer. And so the idea is, can we manage this valve over time? One of the things I'm really lucky to get to participate in is not only putting the valves in, but also re-replacing them down the road through transcatheter procedures, which we do as a heart team. The valves themselves now with this idea in mind of, hey, this valve is not what God gave you. It's not gonna last as long as what you originally had, but what can we do to manage this? They put some markers in there so that when we're putting a transcatheter valve in, which means a valve that we go in through the vein of the leg, come over and cross over the inside of the heart, and we deposit that valve right where the other one is, we use those markers to help position it right where it needs to be. Dr. Smith, that is 
fantastic for the patient. Are there any other advantages that patients should know about when it comes to a transcatheter valve and valve procedure? There sure are. First off, it's a heart team approach, which oftentimes means that there's a cardiac surgeon, a cardiologist, and an imaging specialist all involved, which means you're getting three minds involved in placing this one valve. And the big thing that the patient notices, because that's all happening in the back end or in the midst of the procedure, is they see a poke hole in the groin and they're going home the next day. They usually get an echo before they leave that confirms, hey, the valve is looking good, but the overall experience is a much shorter one than the original surgery was. Dr. Smith, uh, it's great to hear three minds working together on a transcatheter valve and valve that uh, requires no incision to the patient's chest or ribs. So thank you and your team for what you're doing there at Baylor Scott and White. I guess one of the big questions that I'd have for you is, what is your number one piece of advice for a patient considering a mitral valve replacement procedure? When a patient comes in and we're going to have a discussion about mitral valve replacement surgery and something I would recommend to all patients when they go see their surgeon to have this discussion is that that surgeon is ready and willing to listen to what the patient factors are that's going to help them in determining what's the right solution for them right then at that time and going forward. Meaning, are we going to have a plan for a long-term management and lifestyle management along with this? And that's something we get from the patient. So you should come out with the shared decision at the end of that visit of what you're gonna do, either surgery with an idea of transcatheter approaches down the road or an idea of maybe a mechanical valve and anticoagulation. But you, the patient, are very much the centerpiece of anything we discuss in the office. Dr. Smith, that, that is great advice. And I hope the patients really listen to that idea of a shared decision with your medical team. And as always, Dr. Smith, I want to thank you for taking time away from your very busy practice there at Baylor Scott & White, the Heart Hospital in Plano, Texas. Really enjoyed having you with us today. Adam, it's been great being here with you and all those folks who are out there at heartvalvesurgery.com. Uh, this has been a really important and wonderful discussion. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.